Hi, Attorney Rob Wells here from the Law Office of Robert Wells. And in this video, we're going to talk about the statewide uh, rent control statute contained in AB 1482. Hey everyone, this is Attorney Rob Wells with you from the Law Office of Robert Wells. In this video, we're going to go over California's statewide rent control um, that was just passed in September of 2019 here. Okay, so what's all this about? This is part of the AB 1482 package, which added three new code sections, uh, Civil Code 1946.2, uh, 1947.12, which we're going to be talking about now, and uh, 1947.13, which adds an exemption for uh, owners that are builders that build ultra low housing and so forth that exempt them from the provisions of 1947.12. Um, in the other video, we just covered uh, eviction control under 1946.2. This video is going to cover the rent control portion of the new statute here. And again, and all these codes go into effect January 1st of 2020 so let's just dive right into it okay so civil code 1947.12 will apply to most tenancies um, more tenancies than the eviction control statute under 1946.2 as the protections under this new code section are much more broader than the exemptions um, in 1946.2 um, so let's go over those items here. So uh, for 1947 to apply, generally speaking, um, it's going to generally apply to multifamily properties, um, a, a corporation, a real estate investment trust, a REIT, and or LLC that uh, has at least one corporate member who owns any type of residential property, and owners and or tenants who rent out rooms or units in single family homes or other residential rental uh, uh, residential properties. You are not exempt, unlike some of the carve outs in uh, 1946. Uh, point two, um, the, the statute is much more broader and we'll go over the differences uh, in the next few slides here. Okay, so um, the title is wrong on the eviction restrictions. It's actually 1947.12 that we're referencing. The text basically goes into this. An owner of residential real property shall not over the course of any 12 month period increase the gross rental weight rates of any dwelling or unit more than 5% plus the change of cost of living, which we will cover in greater detail in the next couple of slides. Um, it's the CPI index. We'll show you how to get to there um, and so forth. You can increase the rent 5% plus the change of CPI or 10%, whatever is lower, okay? Um, and I highlighted those items here um, that excludes any rent incentives such as you know rent discounts instead of concessions to get you know um, tenants in the door so forth we'll cover that more in detail um, for my owners and our tenants that rent rooms yes the legislature was targeting you folks as well too uh, under provision c a tenant of residential real property subject to the section shall not enter into a sublease that results in the total rent of the premises that exceeds the allowable rental rate authorized under subdivision a so yes you guys got targeted as well too um so yeah um that's all i can say about that so what are the takeaways uh, for non-exempt properties? As again, um, as stated earlier, we're reading the code section, your rental increases can never exceed 10%. Um, you only get the 5% increase plus the change in cost of living up to a maximum of 10%, whatever is lesser. Um, even if your property is exempt under this 1947.12, uh, um, you are still subject to Penal Code 396. And for all those that don't know what Penal Code 396 is, it's an anti-price gouging statute that can be um, activated upon a state of emergency. Um, the, you know, our pg e power shutoffs, the wildfires that we've uh, suffered the last couple of months. And, you know, it's happening on a year to year annual basis now. So just expect that there may be a state of emergency in a place and for the entire state or different parts of the county. 
We'll cover all that in a separate bonus video for you about Penal Code 396. So just know if you are exempt under this, you may be subject to anti-price gouging. And we'll cover the consequences of you know violating that statute later on. Um, landlords get what we call price D control. So if a tenant lawfully vacates the property, well, um, landlords get to set the rental price at market uh, rate when the unit's vacant. Um, there's a whole long slew uh, story behind that. There's another uh, uh, state statute that allows landlords um, to do that and so forth. And that's what this code, this code section is also um, applying that same principle. Um, except in a state of emergency, uh, you can't price gouge. So generally, owners get to set the rental market rate, and then for any increases that happen after the initial rate is set, well, you're limited to what uh, the 5% plus CPI or 10%, okay? Um, if a tenant has uh, resided in the unit over any 12-month period, the gross rental rate cannot be increased in more than two increments. So sorry, owners, you can't raise your rents every month or, you know, every three months and so forth. You get two increases within that 12 month period. And always exceptions may apply to owners that fall within specific circumstances and our conditions. OK, we're going to cover those next. So what are the exemptions generally? And note, note if you saw the video on the eviction control statute, um, this list of exemptions is much, uh, it, it, there, there are few, they're fewer than the ones in 1946.2. So basically we have six exemptions here. It's either, um, housing restricted by deed, uh, regulate, uh, regulatory restriction containing an agreement by a government entity, you know, for persons and families of very low, low or moderate, uh, income. So if you have one of the, if you qualify under that, um, 1947.12 will not apply to you. Uh, dorms operated by a higher education institute within the state for use and occupancy by students and attendants at that institution. If you're paying attention in the other video about uh, eviction control, um, this ex uh, exemption for dorms is much uh, more narrower than the one uh, for the eviction control statute. Um, it's only for uh, colleges or universities that have dorms for their students. So uh, you can't jack up the rent. Uh, you can, you know, you're not subject to regulation if you are a dorm of a higher education institute. Um, housing subject to local rent or price control that restricts annual increases in rents to an amount. Uh, less than the 1947.12 rate, which in other words means it's more restrictive than the state statute allows. So if, you know, you got a city ordinance that says, hey, look, you can't raise rents more than 2%. Well, guess what? That uh, local ordinance is going to apply um, instead of this statute. Um, for all those owners uh, that have uh, built new construction within the last 15 years if you have a certificate of occupancy within the last 15 years you are exempt from 1947.12 you get to raise the rents uh, to whatever you want um, absent um, penal code 396 applying uh, because you built housing and so forth the legislature put that in there to um, quote unquote um, uh, encourage builders to build in california we'll see if that will happen or not still um you know long story short on it well i'll get off my soapbox there uh a single family homes exemption um as long as you're not a corporation REIT or llc that has at least one member that's a corporation you are exempt from these provisions in 1947.12 and a duplex owner where one of, where the owner resides in one of the units as their principal place of residence at the beginning of the tenancy, so long as the owner continues in occupancy. So you are exempt from regulation so long as you have a primary residence in a duplex. Um, as the folks in um, um, the, the podcast Bigger Pockets say, if you're house hacking in your duplex, you are exempt now. Triplexes, fourplexes, and so forth, and no dice on that deal because it's specifically duplex. Okay, um, 
So, what about my owners that rent out single-family homes, they live in the home, or even tenants? Um, where's your exemption? Well, I don't know if this was uh, per done on purpose or if it was just an oversight. Um, I could see the legislature saying, hey, that this may be a problem or not um, against um, owners, uh, or, I mean, tenants and owners that rent single family homes. If you read 1947.12, clearly there's no provision for um, like master tenants or tenants that rent out rooms, you know, to pay for their housing and so forth. It says residential real property that is alienable from the title of any other unit. So an owner of a single family home and it mentions owner, owner, not tenant, owner so there's that um you know in in the code section that would c make a reasonable attorney believe that yeah tenants you're not covered plus if you went back to 1947.12 um at the beginning um in subsection c a tenant is prohibited from renting out um entering into a sublease that exceeds the amounts that are allowed charged in uh, subsection A, which is up here. So um, unlike our 1946.2 exemptions where there are a bunch of exemptions if the owner lives, you know, uh, shares a bathroom or kitchen facility and the prince and their principal residence or single family owner occupied residences where they rent out or lease no more than two units and stuff. That is in the eviction control statute, not in the rent control statute. So I think they purposely did this. Um, but, you know, you need to you need to go write your legislature and vote at the uh, at the ballot box. Um, if you don't like what your legislature did, thank you, legislature. This is a wonderful gift for 2020. Um, you know, and I'm being sarcastic here, so um, you can tell how I feel about this. So, if 1947.12 applies, how do we get our cost of living? And I'll be honest with you guys, kids, I went to law school not to do math. But, you know, the legislature sometimes makes you do math, and I'll be, uh, I'll tell you the truth, this kind of threw me for a loop, and it, it took me a while to actually figure it out. Okay, so here's what we have to do. The percentage change in the cost of living under the code section, under 1947.12D, uh, G2 states that it means the... Cha percentage change from April 1st of the prior year, and in our case, if we're talking 2019, we'd look to 2018, and we go to April 1st of the current year in the Regional Consumer Price Index for the region where the residential real property is located, as published by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay, um, there's a the, um, the labor the Bureau of Labor Statistics posts. Um, statistical information for the changes of cost of living known as the CPI index okay um, and they do it for major metros in California there's five okay and we'll cover that shortly here now if your property is not in that region where the Bureau of Labor Statistics supplies the code section 1947.12 states that you have to look at the California Consumer Price Index for all urban consumers for all items as determined by the Department of Industrial Relations. Okay, um, that's where that confused me in the beginning um, because, you know, you can't really just go to the, lab, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and kind of find this number. They don't pr produce a percentage. It's actually numbers and you actually have to do math folks and um yeah some um we were having a hard time actually trying to calculate that so um the first step in calculating cpi as you call it will be find out your regional metro area where the cpi u index is published for the san francisco bay area you can go to the bureau of labor statistics at this link here um, we'll post it in the notes here so you can go directly to it but you're going to ask me rob if my area is not published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where do you go? Well, you have to go to the Department of Industrial Relations, like the code said. There's a link below here, and I'll show you um, the regions that are published by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics.
in the next slide here because this is the index for California and this is what you have to do okay so I don't know if you guys can see these numbers here I know um, individual screens are going to be different or whatnot but basically for all areas that are not in these air uh, the areas where the federal CPI index is calculated which would be Los Angeles Long Beach Anaheim or the Bay Area which would consist of San Francisco Oakland and Hayward um, note that we only have one index for Northern California and the others are in um, Southern California I'm sorry I said five or four okay so what California does is they average the four in the state and they get this number they get they get numbers so what the code section says if you don't have a regional index you got to go use the state index and in this case we would be using these two numbers here because these numbers in April come out April 1st of every year and you'll notice in April of 2019 you're gonna get this 280.275 number and then for last year um, of April, this uh, that time of year around, it was 271.210. Okay, so in the next slide here, we're going to show you how, how, what do you do with those numbers to get that CPS. Had to come, had to go back to the 1947.12 um, section about calculating CPI. We had a mathematical error on our slide here, and I wanted to uh, make sure we got that fixed there. So. Um, in order to calculate the CPI and uh, number, you're going to take those two numbers from 2019 and 2018 that we just highlighted, um, and the number for 2019 was 280.275, and you're going to minus it from the uh, 2018 number, which is 271.210. Um, if you subtract that from one another, you're going to get the difference of 9.065. Write that number down somewhere because you're going to need that number, um, to, and you have to divide it in the um, the CPI U number that California does uh, for the, the the prior year. And in this case, it would be the two seven one point two one zero number. Um, if you divide that number into each other, it's going to come up with point zero three three four percent. And that's basically what you can raise uh, the rent for. Um, in that year um, okay so let's see let's go to the next slide so in this case if we were to do the uh, the rental increase this year it would be five percent plus three point three four percent the change in CPI from 2018 reaching a total of eight point three four percent thus for any properties that are uh, that don't have a CPI index published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on the federal end of things, you can only raise the rent 8.34% um, in, in, in this case here because you have to use the state numbers. And apparently what the state does is they average the four numbers from the federal government provides and it comes up with an average, basically. So that's how we got that number there. And for all those that don't understand how CPI indexes work and so forth, get in the numbers, you can go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They have like a, a wonderful fact sheet there, and that's how we figured out how to calculate the CPI. Kind of hard when the legislature's making you guys do math. Um, this was kind of hard for me, but again, I'm not, I'm not a whiz kid. I'm just trying to follow the law and color in between the lines here. So um, maybe you guys found that a little bit easier than I did. So good for you in that case. Okay, so what does um, the base rent include and not include uh, in this case? So when determining uh, the gross rent, um, it does not include any of the following incentives or promotions. Um, and that would be any rent discounts, incentives, concessions, or credits offered by the owner for such unit of residential property and accepted by the tenant. And that shall be excluded from the um, rent calculation uh, for the, um, the 5% plus CPI, change of CPI. Okay. Now, if you're going to 
offer incentives and so forth, uh, they must be specifically listed and identified in the contract or addendums or documents to the rental agreement. So uh, no oral agreements, folks, about, hey, um, you know, I'll give you $500 rent discounts. Not going to fly in this case. And in light of all these provisions, it's, it, it, this is this is just my 50 cents here. You need to have written rental agreements, folks. I mean, um, with, the, with the change in laws here, an oral agreement, it's just going to get you in more and more trouble with all these regulations thank you california legislature again okay um uh, and again the quotes and the parentheses are you know the monthly rental rate any offer owner incentives and so forth will be excluded from the rent calculation okay and that's under the code section itself i don't know why we have that in there okay let's skip that okay so what happens if you raise the rents in 2019 okay and they go over the five percent plus cpi index uh rule what must you have to do okay the golden question we have to ask is did you raise rents uh between march 15 2019 but prior to january 1st of 2020 uh what happens okay does civil code 1947 apply to you if it does, if you answered yes, and you raise the rents more than the permitted 5% plus your applicable change uh, and CPI index, um, and, and, and in cases where there's no federal index, if you went over 8.34%, the legislature left you a wonderful rent clawback provision in the code section. You will be required by January 1st of 2020 to get your rents in compliance with the new uh, statute ASAP because um, if you don't um, you're probably gonna have trouble doing an eviction and all kinds of other trouble a lot you know suits to get your uh, rents back into compliance here but the legislature kind of didn't make it as bad it, it was gonna be worse you were actually gonna have to uh, before this bill got passed the legislature originally had in here that you were gonna have to write a refund check by January 1st um, in this case, um, tenants are not entitled to keeping uh, the difference in rent that you charge. So let's say you charge 10% rent and you only can charge 8.34%. Well, throughout 2019, you can charge the 10% rent and you don't have to give anything back to the tenants in between uh, March 15, 2019 through January 1st, 2020. Okay, side note. For all my price gougers from 2017 during those wildfires or uh, the wildfires of 2018, if your rents went over 10% over the state of emergency rates, if your county declared a state of emergency, um, there's no safe harbor for you. There's no, you know, um, compliance period. Uh, you're probably going to have to refund those uh, monies back. Because you're subject to Penal Code 396, which we'll cover in, a, um, in our bonus video here, okay? Um, this immunity under 1947.12 uh, is not going to apply to you, okay? Okay. And again, if you watch the video for uh, the eviction control provisions, um, there will be new disclosures for you in 2020. Uh, landlords, again, must disclose to tenants if uh, the landlord is subject to the new eviction control laws or if they are exempt, okay? So let's go back, let's go over that again. Um, owners subject to the new eviction and or rent control statute uh, must do the following. If you are uh, included in these provisions here, you have to provide your tenants this disclosure. Um, on or after July 1st, 2020, the disclosure that's on the screen must be provided in the rental agreement. If uh, you had a tenancy before July 1st, 2020, uh, you get to August 1st, 2020 to either give your notice, um, give your tenant a notice um, that the statute applies to you and or you're to put it in the renewal uh, or addendum to the rental agreement uh, once you renew the uh, rental agreement. And again, for my month to month um, landlords, yeah, you gotta you, you, you gotta provide an addendum or put it in a notice, okay? Just and, and you have to put it verbatim that the statute applies to you. 
and for my exempt owners you get a disclosure requirement too and it's basically telling the tenants that you are exempt and you're certifying that you're exempt under the statute again same kind of uh rationale for new tenancies entered into on or after july 1st 2020 you have to put the disclosure in the rental agreement and for tenancies entered before july 1st 2020 you have to provide notice to your tenant by august 1st 2020 or you have to put it in uh, an addendum to the rental agreement or in the renewal of the rental agreement that the property is not subject to control uh, again all these provisions are in place until july 1st 2030 and of that date they're repealed but it's my cynical opinion that the legislature at the last minute before this thing expires is going to say we need to make these provisions permanent the landlords are killing the tenants out there uh, with these price increases and they're being super greedy so we must protect them and I think they're going to be made permanent so I'm sorry that's my 50 cents that's my opinion you take it for what it's worth okay um, and if you have any questions you can call the office here all right I uh, appreciate you staying with me um, with all these provisions if you have any questions which I'm pretty sure you may have some please feel free to contact us okay thanks and have a great day